Okay, with that, let me um, move on to our first speaker. And our first speaker is, uh, this afternoon is Megan Rua. And Megan got her undergraduate degree at Rice University, her PhD at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's presently a postdoc uh, fellow at Lynn Miles mm -hmm. at the National Institute for Mathematical and Biological Synthesis in Knoxville in Tennessee. She specializes in plant microbe interactions and works with fungal based organic fluidity. Uh, she's published extensively in ecology, ecologia, theoretical ecology, American naturalist, food mycologist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And today she's telling us about her exploration of the relative importance of biotic and abiotic sources of selection for prime fungal interactions. Great, thank you. And I want to thank all of you for coming back from lunch uh, for this talk today. And I also want to mention that I am talking about work that is brand new, hot off the presses. So please don't take any pictures of the slides and post them, but you are more than welcome to write everything down and come talk to me afterwards. And in fact, I really encourage you to do so. So if I put up a slide like this, many people can look at this and instantly understand that there's a lot of form and function in plants. But if I put up a similar slide with fungi, you don't necessarily have a good understanding of what these guys are doing. Although here, I kind of cheated and I told you what they're doing. But what we know is that all of these things are involved in species interactions. And this inter specific species interaction grid is one way that we tend to think about species interactions. So I've highlighted here the continuum from mutualism to predation and parasitism that I tend to think about, but there are lots of different types of interactions. And these types of interactions, in addition to being incredibly important for ecological outcomes, can be important for evolutionary outcomes as well. And so one of the things that I've become more and more interested in is the role of coevolution in shaping these close interactions. So coevolution is important because it's the reciprocal evolution of two or more species, and it happens in close ecological interactions. So things that you may be more familiar with are things like the fox and the hare, isopod parasites and their fish, ants and uh, their aphids, or even my personal favorite, mycorrhizal fungi and their plants, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. Additionally, these interactions can also span this continuum in which we're seeing lots of different types of interactions co-evolving, not just negative interactions as sometimes is thought when you just look at the literature. So today we're gonna to talk about mycorrhizae. So E.O. Wilson once said that in order to stand, understand life on land, we must understand mycorrhizal relationships. So I'm just gonna give you a quick primers that we're all on the same page before I really get into it. So mycorrhizas are, uh, have long evolved with their host plants. So it's thought that over 400 million years ago, land plants and mycorrhiza had co-evolved together. But today we're gonna to talk about one type of mycorrhiza, ectomycorrhiza, which have been evolving with their host plants for over 200 million years. They primarily associate with woody plants like pines, oaks, beeches, birches, and they're unique in that we often see their fruiting bodies above ground, but there's a whole host of things going on below ground that we don't always see. And as indicated here by a photo I've taken of some mycorrhiza that have colonized the root tips of this plant. One of the things that's really important about mycorrhizal relationships is an exchange of nutrients. So mycorrhiza are able to gather nutrients in the soil that a plant can't obtain on their own. Primarily, ectomycorrhiza are gathering things like nitrogen and water in exchange for carbon from the host plant. And they're doing this exchange in a relationship that we often think of as mutualistic, but you can imagine certain outcomes in which this isn't mutualistic. So for instance, we might see outcomes when ectomycorrhiza are less good at giving them the nutrients in return for the carbon they're getting. And this might set up an important context for coevolution. So as I mentioned, coevolution is reciprocal selection, and in mycorrhizal relationships in particular, you might expect that selection is going to be favoring individuals which are uh, gaining from the system. So in, sim or in uh, mycorrhizal relationships, what we're thinking about here is a way to maximize both host and symbiont fitness as a function of the host, of the genotype of the host and those associated traits, the genotype and the symbiont and those associated traits. But the problem with understanding coevolution in mycorrhizae is that it's really context dependent and the context itself is ever evolving. So when we start thinking about how selection is favoring the recognition of these uh, relationships, we think that Selection might favor the plant to recognize really beneficial mycorrhiza, 
and kick out non-beneficial mycorrhiza, which should lead to variation in colonization among different genotypes of the host. But in order to understand coevolution, there are a few things that we need to do first. First, it's widely accepted that coevolution has played an important role in shaping these relationships in the past. But we don't know what's happening with these relationships currently. Are we still seeing coevolution? Are we just seeing remnants of the past interactions? What's going on at this state? And so in order to really start to understand what's happening with mycorrhizal relationships in the current time and possibly in the past time, we need to understand what the current contribution of coevolution is to diversifying relationships in mycorrhizal fungi. Additionally, instead of coevolution, we, what we might be seeing is just parallel evolution in response to abiotic pressures. So in order to tease out what's going on, whether we're seeing parallel evolution or coevolution in action, you need data from experiments which are directly estimating selection on plant and mycorrhizal fitness. So there are a number of different outcomes that we might expect from selection in mycorrhiza, and we've talked about one a little bit already, but we're going to talk about all of them right now. So you might expect to, see, expect to see stabilizing selection in which you're getting a strict mutualism. So this is a situation which is favoring complementarity. Everyone's happy, everyone's getting the same amount of nutrients, everything is working great. But you also could expect to see diversifying selection such that no combination of the host and the uh, symbiont are doing well. And so this might favor a rare genotype to sneak in there and um, exploit the relationship. Finally, we also might expect to see linear, strong linear selection driving this relationship from mutualism to parasitism or vice versa. And this might, in fact, favor cheaters to get in there um, and, and drive the, the relationship. But what we don't know is what is happening. So in order to explore these types of relationships, I started examining this question in a couple of different ways. So what we're going to do is first break down mycorrhizal relationships and look at how, uh, how the mycorrhizal relationship is altering plant traits by themselves. And then we're going to look and see what's happening with mycorrhizal mediated selection. But in particular, we're going to pay special attention to what's happening with both directional selection and stabilizing or diversifying selection. So coniferous plants prevent a perfect opportunity for looking at these types of interactions. Coniferous plants associate with a suite of microorganisms, all the way from strict mutualists to strict parasi parasites. Additionally, or, and for this system, I'm going to work on Monterey pine or Pinus radiata. So Pinus radiata is particularly unique because it's relatively short-lived for a pine, which means that you know, it only lives to be about 80, right? And then it's also unique in that it's widely planted for timber, but is currently restricted to only five locations in its native range, three off the coast, or three along the coast of California, and two off the coast of Baja, two islands. This restriction has led Pinus radiata to diverge in a number of important phenotypic characteristics. Here I've illustrated it with cone size, but we also know that Pinus radiata has differed in other characteristics, including uh, bark type and size. So we see island pines being shorter and fatter with thinner bark than the mainland pines, which are much taller, have thicker bark. But more importantly, from my point of view, we know that they've diverged upon on their relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. So these are just the, uh, the mainland populations. And we know that when we look at what's going on with the families of mycorrhizal fungi that are present in these systems, we see that we have different relationships between what's happening at each of the different populations. So this tells us that there's the potential for different genotypic controls to control the different relationship between mycorrhizal fungi and their hosts. So to bring back the questions, this is what we're going to be exploring today in this system. And one way to evaluate such selection pressures in an area in which we know that the pines are all having different genetic backgrounds is to grow them in the same location. So as to use a common garden experiment which controls for abiotic factors like rainfall, sunlight, day length, but allow and biotic factors. So in this case, we want the plants to be able to be colonized by any sort of fungi that are present in the system. And this will allow us to determine whether the mycorrhizal relationship is being 
structured by the plant host itself or it's being structured by an overall environmental community. So to do this, I planted out 12,000 plants in 43 different families. So how did I get there? So I've got plants from the five different populations as well as crosses from the same or from the population. So this can include a cross between a mainland and an island pine, or it can include a cross from an island pine and an island pine, or a mainland pine and a mainland pine. All of these different families were designed to give me a large variation of traits that are available for the fungi to capitalize on. So some of these may grow really fast, some may grow slow, some may grow very uh, big roots, some may grow very small roots, and this trait landscape will allow for me to evaluate selection. I planted this experiment at uh, Rancho Moreno Reserve in Cambria, California. It's a UC reserve, and it's one of the only remaining, remaining locations of Monterey Pine. Um, unfortunately, I managed to catch the hottest, driest summer on record. So we're gonna call it an extreme selection event. Um, and the pines were allowed to grow for about four months until I had to determine to call the experiment, otherwise they would have all died and I wouldn't have been able to assess mycorrhizal infection at all. Um, so what, but what did I measure? So I measured several different pine and microbe traits. So some obvious pine trait survival, it's a big one. Overall biomass, root to shoot ratio, relative growth rate, which I proxy as the length of needle bearing stem. So in pines, uh, the tallest uh, needle is often thought to be the one that's growing the best. And specific root length, which is a function of the total root length by, divided by the root biomass. The microbe traits I measured were root tip abundance, so just how many, uh, how much of the fungi were present on the root tip. And then I've also identified them with Sanger, Sanger sequencing, so we know what the players are in this system now. Additionally, I've got measurements of species richness, exploration types, which are how the fungi are exploring the soil for these nutrients, and fungal height of biomass. While I have data on these things, I don't have a chance to talk about them today, and instead we're just gonna focus on the root tip abundance. However, if at any point uh, you're interested in exploring these, I have some great ideas and things to talk about. Additionally, fitness is an important thing to think about when you're thinking about long-lived species. So for plants, we're gonna use overall biomass as a proxy for fitness. We know that the ability of a plant to survive three months as well as, uh, or is co heavily correlated with the ability of the pine to survive 10 years in the system. So the, and the ability to survive is also correlated with how big you get in the system. And so we're using biomass as a proxy. And for fungus, what we're gonna use is tip abundance. So the present, not only the presence of a fun mycorrhizal fungi, but how much is there as an, a proxy for how fit the fungi is. And so just to orient you and these graphs, because I'm gonna show a few of them. So what we're talking about as response to our uh, questions today will be selection coefficients. So the selection coefficients are the values here and they correspond to different colors. So the darker the color, the more positive the selection coefficient, the sort of lighter the color, the more negative. The stars indicate statistical significance and what the first uh, row here will be the selection differential or a measure of total selection and the second row will be linear selection and the third row will be quadratic selection. So this is going to tell us whether we're seeing this uh, linear selection for parasitism or mutualism and this is going to tell us whether we're seeing stabilizing or diversifying selection. And so when we just look at plant traits and how plant traits are influencing plant fitness, we see that we have total selection for everything and we're going to go into what's happening with linear selection and quadratic selection in detail in just a minute. But if we compare what's happening with total selection for plant fitness and total selection for fungal fitness, we can start to suss out some interesting patterns. So we can see that of the traits that we're interested in for plants, all of the traits are statistically significant, are undergoing statistically significant selection, except for root to shoot ratio in fungal fitness. But what does that actually mean? So what is that translating to? So when we think about how selection is shaping plant fitness, we see that there are two traits which are leading, or have negative selection on plant fitness and two traits which have positive selection. So both root to shoot ratio and specific root length are undergoing negative selection when it comes to plant fitness, but relative growth rate and diameter are both going towards positive selection. 
And this is interesting when we think about it in terms of stabilizing or destructive selection. So I didn't have the power to detect root to shoot or specific root length, statistically significant selection for root to shoot or specific root length for stabilizing and diversifying selection, or disruptive selection, excuse me. But I did for relative growth rate and diameter, and in fact, we see that there are separate mechanisms going on. So relative growth rate is actually uh, experiencing disruptive selection, so you're starting to see things veer away, and diameter is experiencing stabilizing selection. And so what this is telling us is that we're seeing selection for plants that are becoming uh, fatter and shorter. So we're getting selection in this system during this time of water stress for plants that are um, able to grow but not very fast and are spending more time growing outwards than up. And if we flip it around and think about it in terms of fungal fitness, then we see very different patterns. So the only significance, even though we saw total selection in three different traits, the only selection that's significant for uh, fungal traits or for the plant traits, whoo, just kidding, for the uh, plant traits on fungal fitness is we see a positive selection here for a root to shoot ratio on fungal fitness, but we can't detect any statistically significant selection on specific root length relative growth rate or diameter. And if we turn it around, we see that we do get significant quadratic selection when we think about diameter as influenced by fungal fitness, and we think, er, and most of this is turning out to be disruptive selection. So the fungi themselves are changing things. So if we take it together, we see that um, even though we are detecting statistically significant selection for a diameter relative growth rate and specific root length on overall fungal fitness, most of that is either due to directional selection for root to shoot ratio or disruptive selection for diameter. But what does that mean if we start taking it together? So I've already said that root to shoot ratio and specific root length for plant selection is looking for decreasing whereas diameter and relative growth rate is mostly increasing. And if we overlay the fungal relationship on there, if we uh, throw out root to shoot ratio, which wasn't statistically significant, the patterns are about the same when we think about total selection. So that indicates that it's likely that if we are able to test the direct interaction of fungi on plant traits, that we're gonna be able to detect statistically significant selection of the mycorrhiza itself. And so that's what we did here. In order to really determine what if mycorrhiza is mediating selection, we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the interaction, which is combining the plant trait and the fungal trait and allowing for the true assessment of coevolution. So this is the same type of graph that I mentioned before. And we can see that unfortunately, we don't have statistically significant selection at all on the plant traits resulting from their covariance with fungal abundance. However, we do pick up a signal for quadratic selection for specific root length. And this is interesting because it's disruptive. So, what, so we don't see statistically significant selection for linear selection, but the disrupt, or it's, I'm sorry, it's stabilizing. So the stabilizing selection is indicating that the plants want longer roots when it comes to this mycorrhizal mediated selection, but that's not necessarily translating to changes. So while we, uh, couldn't statistically significantly detect directional selection on the plant traits resulting from the covariance with tip abundance, we did pick up signals that were potentially important for interactions when it comes to stabilizing or diversifying selection. So if we take it all together, this is the interaction of what happens when you look at plant fitness and fungal fitness all together. And this is what happens when we start thinking about whether mycorrhizae are mediating these interactions. So we know that it's possible that for at least for this particular fungal trait, we're getting a sense that specific root length is important. But as I mentioned, we've got other traits to look at as well. And some of these traits are turning out to be uh, also very interesting. And so with that, I wanna go ahead and thank the University of Mississippi, which hosted me as an NSF postdoctoral research fellow for three years. Um, and Wells Nimbus, which is, uh, I've been at for a year, or just about a year. And I will take any questions, and I wanted to say if you are interested in contacting me, I'm currently in Nimbus, but we're joining the faculty at Wright State University in August. And thank you very much.
So that's a really good question. So the question was on uh, dispersal and sort of life history in these two players. So we don't know a ton about life history of the fungi in this system. So um, I can tell you that we didn't get any suspicious looking invaders. So the fungi that I recovered from these roots are similar to things that we find in these systems and that uh, other laboratories who also work in this part of California have found before. Um, so that tells you that they're probably all native fungi. And we know that the trees themselves, the populations, historically were throughout Southern California, um, but have been separated for mo millions of years. And so that's how the evolution with the pine separating out has happened. We know that early genetic research looking at allozymes has shown that they have diverged genetically as well. That research hasn't been repeated with more uh, recent molecular techniques, but it's something we're considering. Um, but we know that pines do not grow without their mycorrhizal fungi, um, and they don't grow successfully. So it's really hard in a greenhouse, for example, to grow a pine without mycorrhizal fungi for anything of uh, significant duration. So their relationship is incredibly important for their growth and survival. So we didn't. So we didn't, what we would expect, and so the question was about local adaptation in the system. And so what we would have expected, because these were, these were all grown in Cambria, so you would expect Cambria pines to outgrow everybody else. And we actually don't see that. You see an effect of mainland pine doing better. So the mainland pine does better than the island pine. So we, in that sense, you see sort of a signal for local adaptation, but it's not true local adaptation. So, um, and that might also be because the island pines have diverged that much more genetically. So the island pines are actually bi so they're two needles, whereas the mainland pines are still three needles. And so that could indicate the underlying genetic structure is a little more complicated there. Uh, we also know that the island pines themselves are um, not doing well. So when you grow them, for instance, in a greenhouse trying to plant an experiment, it's possible to get albino seedlings. Oh, which is not is an indicator that the population is not uh, doing well. So. Just to, to follow up on that, what about the connection with the mycorrhizae? Did they do better on the local or mainland pines? So the mycorrhizae themselves, the, we so the community involved here is pretty diverse, um, although most of them tend to be from the same family, and that's because seedlings tend to be colonized more by a certain type of mycorrhizal fungi. So you s just with plants, how you see succession, you actually sort of see that with seedlings as well. Um, and I have done work, which we should be able to get to, looking at selection of the separate uh, OTUs, which is a proxy for species in, in this context. And we see that our most common one, so the most common family is this Telephoraceae, and the most common OTUs are uh, experiencing at least a little bit of a signal of selection, and it's mostly a linear selection. And so you're starting to see that relationship. Um, the work that I'm still hammering out statistically is whether it's being driven by a single OTU or whether it's being driven at the family level. Any other questions? So I've always struggled with the, you know, thinking about what the traits that we would measure in plants, and in particular, yeah. thinking about melon growth rate. Is that a measure of fitness, or is that a trait of the selector? And, and the, how did you resolve that? So that's a really uh, tough question. And so I resolved it by doing the analysis both ways, because I never convinced myself fully. And then the reason I did eventually convince myself fully is uh, relative growth rate wasn't really capturing the overall fitness of the plants. So it wasn't scaling with, say, survival, um, or it wasn't, and it wasn't scaling uh, with biomass like you thought you think it would. And so I've done models using relative growth rate as the proxy for fitness directly. I've done models not including relative fitness. Um, and the, the results are all very robust to that, which is important. Uh, but I think in terms of interpretation as well in this system, biomass is a better proxy than relative growth rate. But it's a, it's a hard thing, especially with something like plants that are long-lived and you're using these short-lived seedlings as proxies. 
where in some ways you're limited because if you want to say something meaningful, this is what you have to do. But at the same token, it's important to understand that there are limitations. Okay, great. That's uh, great. Thank you again. Thanks. <laughs>